All right, so let me connect to the um, um, uh, the presentation that Anselmo and uh, Lindia were talking about earlier on about Kamakura and whatnot. So this is, uh, you know, s related to that topic here. So first of all, I mean, um, I'm talking about a different topic now. So I'm talking about, and we'll see how these two things connect. Um, if you look at, I just look at the central message here that um, we anticipate that over the coming years, bank will upgrade to more an integrated approach, allowing planning and stress scenarios to be carried out across all aspects of balance sheet. So essentially, what's really happening is, um, for and if you look at all the messages here, essentially the idea is that when we build balance sheets uh, for today, or you are projecting balance sheets uh, for uh, into the future, performer balance sheets, I should call them, you're essentially, for all the line items, um, you need different aspects. You need to make sure that the pieces that make the balance sheet can keep up with the balance sheet projections you're doing. So for example, you want to project a balance sheet uh, a year out. <laughs> you need to know, um, you know what your registrations look like. How many new loans will you be issuing, for example? Or if you have issued those loans, you want to know what are the uh, expected losses that you will incur for it, right? That's, that's one problem. Second is if you have loans, you want, if you, have, you want to project balance sheets, you also want to know uh, from a budget standpoint, is what your um, net in interest income will look like? What will your non-interest expenses look like? What does your non-interest interest, uh, income look like? So the PPNR modeling, that has to be a part of that process as well. So in the past, what's happened is from our, what we see with customers is that these are all disparate systems. They don't talk to each other. So it's very difficult for people to create a really comprehensive balance sheet looking forward. <clears throat> I'll go just one step further. So, so it's, it's a, and, and the, the reasons for this, of course, is that the number of risk factors are very, uh, is volatile, and we gave some examples of interest rates here. The data is, the, the, the technology that is used to build these things together is somewhat dated, right? So it's very difficult for these technologies to support the kinds of business functions users expect to do because it's difficult to work with them. Uh, the cost and complexity uh, <laughs> is obviously a challenge. And the point we made earlier on, which is many of the processes on the risk side are fragmented. It's getting it's a lot better than what it was like, let's say, 10 years back uh, or eight years back. And um, on the finance side, same issue. So now we are connecting fragmented risk and finance systems together and, and the ALM and being able to create a robust ALM system um, and liquid management system is, is one of the key drivers to get there. So this is just, a, uh, I'm gonna put both of these up here. So on the left-hand side, if you see, and this is a, like a graphical um, form of just what I said. So at the very top, if you look at it, the ALM and liquidity management system, you wanna create a balance sheet, but to understand that process, you need to know that process really have to connect with your regulatory capital management system, right? And it's very, and you know, because with stress testing and things like that, some of this has been achieved to some extent, not completely, but to some extent, and it's evolving too. Uh, and, and that's tied to your scenario analysis stress testing. So in the US, it would be something like your CCAR process, for example, or your DFAS process, for example, right? So these will have to be, because the extracts from those, those uh, uh, runs will have to get back into the balance sheet, right? And it's very difficult to do so, do so without a proper system so that it's running them, making sure the numbers uh, are correct. It's a very hard task, right? You wanna make sure that that's connected to your CECL process, your expected loss process, right? Because that number has to go in there as well through a triple L as well, right? So how do you do that? Then we talked about risk modeling decisioning. All these systems we talked about, ALM, regulatory capital scenario, expected loss, they're all models and data driven. So if you don't have a system whereby the models and the data that you build the models and run on, if you can't control them and you can't uh, have confidence that they ran, ran well and they are not easy to use, it becomes a very, very, um, the overheads are very high. And that's why the risk modeling process has to be somewhat in the pipe 
to be able to achieve what you want to achieve, right? And then we talked about model risk management, that if you want to build models, you want to make sure the models that you have built, you have, you can have confidence and trust, you can prove to your senior management. And uh, um, I, I don't think there's a regulation here in the Israel, but in, in, in the US, for example, there is a regulatory mandate uh, um, the, which, which forces you to kind of actually have a model risk management system, right? And the last piece we just talked about is the financial planning process. So, you know, in a bank, typically, you know, what what uh, what I've seen is like, you know, you obviously create your operating plan for the next four quarters, right? The FPNA group does that. Then you have the monthly alco process, and then you have um, uh, you have regulatory you know regulatory mandates. You could have CCAR, you have DFAST, in Europe you have EBA, and so on, uh, and the ICAP process. Question is trying to align all these numbers to make sure that uh, they're all for different reasons, but they all have to align. And if you don't align them, aligning them is very tough. And regulators are increasingly demand, uh, demanding that these are aligned and you can prove if they're different, why they're different, what did you use differently, uh, what model do you use differently, what data do you use differently, what workflow did you use differently, how did you make sure that these are, um, uh, they converge, right? it becomes a big task for banks. So having this kind of uh, framework which allows you to bring these things together is very critical. And, and what I'm going to show you is that uh, so the SaaS technology and you know, once we talk about with Kamakura and so on, this is going to actually, uh, which is actually going to do exactly that. <clears throat> I'm going to skip this part. So this is a point that I think, and someone was making that if you look at the chart, it's, um, uh, uh, information, it puts, it's on the very top right uh, as an ALM system. So it's a, it's, a, it's a well regarded system. So there are two things um, uh, from, that we acquired from Kamakura. One is the, the asset management solution that, I, that we just talked about, um, which is uh, you know, very well used across the world, right? And there's another piece which is called Chris, right? Essentially, it's a data service where you um, can get corporate and sovereign um, credit defaults, right, and spreads. So you can provide the information and you can get the, uh, and for I think um, pretty much all the major economies, they have numbers for them and they also have the um, defaults for their for, uh, interest rates as well. So, and this is completely a software as a service kind of a routine. Right, so this this obviously helps, you know, the ALM process. So both are available. <laughs> and uh, sorry, I'm going to yeah. So this important one. So one question. So one if you so if you it's a picture we saw earlier on on the left. I'm now put on the right. Exactly the same thing. You see exactly the same boxes here, but some some added information. So let me explain what that is. So at the very top, right? So SaaS has been building an ALM and liquidity management system on the VIA platform. If you remember, the first thing we discussed today was what is VIA, why that foundation is important, and how you can move risk and finance processes on a workload, right? And we explained two examples. One was the risk modeling decisioning part, scoring and collection and decisioning, and we talked about more risk management. But SAS has also been building an ALM liquidity solution on top of it, right? Now with Kamakura, what happens, we just put the Kamakura workload on top of that. So that makes, that will make down the road, uh, the functionality that in the ALM solution will become completely cloud enabled, right? And that means that if you are a user of that ALM system, eventually it will become seamlessly on, uh, on a cloud platform. Similarly, the other thing we just talked about is the data service from Chris. It's essentially going to push, so if you think about this as a, single <laughs> pipeline, essentially that is going to accelerate the ALM, ALM solution that we have. And the, um, the risk data service that I've talked about is going to provide information which will allow you to uh, model and estimate things better and faster. Some quick, I uh, won't read through this, it's a pretty busy uh, slide, so I don't want to go through all of it. But if you look at the very left, I think just focus on that. These things are uh, pretty much all uh, out of the box. So you have, you can do interest rate risk management, net income simulation, cash flow, both behavioral uh, and contractual cash flows. 
liquidity risk, fund transfer of pricing, obviously value at risk, expected shortfall, all the market risk kind of functions, uh, capital analysis, and then you can also obviously do all of them after adjusting for default, okay, using the Chris service, or any other service for the matter. Um, this is some more details on this, but I think the most important point here is this that, um, so the basic idea here uh, is two things. One, you have a ALM solution that uh, can talk to other uh, upstream risk and finance processes. So you have an ALM solution which needs to get data from different pieces, upstream processes, right? So it, it'll get data from the credit risk department, the market risk department, and so on, FPN and so forth. So it can bring it all together. So that's one piece. And by doing so, the second and second piece, by doing so, what you get is just not being able to do ALM, but truly integrated balance sheet management, which means essentially bringing the risk and finance processes together so you can really make a good call on where you are and you can make actual um, uh, uh, projections, right? And this can be done across different scenarios. So if you want to introduce a new scenario set, you want to add a new type of portfolio, you want to change the model for one thing to the other, right? You want to change some of the estimates. All those things become easier to do because now you have an integrated structure so you don't have to scratch your head on how to bring something new in because it has become much more easier for you to do. Um, so these are a bit more details, but I, I think we can skip this for now. But um, the basic idea is this that um, uh, two things. One is that if you have an existing, let's say, um, SaaS, let's say you're doing uh, your CECL in SaaS, right? It doesn't have to be, but let's say you, you did. You can, so because you will have all the loan information in there, right? You can actually make that work with the ALM solution in a much more streamlined fashion. So it becomes easier for you to kind of uh, run this process in much more tighter fashion. But we have to kind of, obviously, depending on where you are, where the bank is, what they have done, not done, kind of sit down and kind of rethink re about how it's gonna work the flow-wise. But it's achievable and it's a very powerful thing to do. So I'm gonna skip some of these things because there are like more details here. Um, so oh, one other thing I was going to mention that the, the one of the very important things about uh, the solution is that there are uh, very powerful um, uh, analytical capabilities like visualization and reporting, which you can deploy to uh, to be able to really you know see in a visual way where things are. So it's not just you know a set of numbers and tables, but you can actually see graphs and easy easy to work with them. You can drag and drop and things like that. Uh, let's skip this part. This is another thing that I was mentioning earlier on. So one of the um, things uh, that I've been noticing uh, with the customers I work with um, is there's a tremendous amount of, and I didn't see this earlier on, so it's been, I've been seeing this for the last few years now, is um, the interest to line up the financial planning and the FPNA, financial planning analysis process, into this into the uh, AL, ALCO process and the uh, credit risk process. So banks are really trying to get their operating plan, their ALCO process, and as I said, the uh, regulatory processes uh, very aligned, right? So I will tell you for a bank I used to work, we had asset base of like, what, $250 billion or something like that, it was a regional bank. Um, and uh, to put just the regulatory um, CCAR process together, uh, we had to take 31st December data and you know, we had to file April in three, three months. We would use something like um, seven to 800 people, not all the time, but it had to touch that many people to get the actual final numbers out. And a lot of that stuff was very manual, right? Someone had to do a spreadsheet, send it over, get it back and write something else, then go back through an email and uh, the intention at the time was to streamline that process and we actually use SaaS, right, to get, solve the problem. But imagine it just for one 
uh, estimates. Now, if you want to do all these other things that I'm just mentioning, it is an extremely uh, arduous process. So what, what, what this system does is it brings the FPNA process, which is a critical process, right? Because, and, and by the way, the hierarchy has changed too, because you know, somebody is managing portfolio, goes to somewhere else, and FPNA process is very spreadsheet oriented, right? So there's a lot of interest among customers, and we're working with a lot of customers in the US right now on this very topic, is how to move those workloads, the FPNA workloads that you have on spreadsheets onto this platform so that you can um, essentially achieve this integration between uh, the treasury group, the LM group, the uh, FPNA group, the market risk team, and the credit team, so you can create a comprehensive picture in a governed fashion, right? Um, and that has been a major uh, sort of uh, change that I have noticed personally in the last couple of years. Um, and by the way, um, the SAS has a solution for financial planning, the one that you use, and that is one of the things which is already on VIA. So uh, we mentioned a couple earlier on, that system is already available on VIA, so you, it, it's available even today. Okay. Um, before I go any further, because um, let me see if there's any, any questions here. These are some reports here, by the way. Any questions around what I said? Let me ask a question. Are you guys um, seeing any of these things I'm discussing here that um, in your institutions, is there anything, anything that you see that, um, that, you, that seems to be something that you guys are looking at and wondering how to kind of um, address? Anyone? I think people are shy. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so yeah. So this is. So the the point here is this that, and we can talk later, and we'll have a bit of a round table here as we discuss more what's happening elsewhere in the world. My my, my uh, focus is U.S. and Canada, and of course Israel. So um, so I can talk about what I'm seeing in those markets, but uh, we would get some other inputs from my colleagues later on, uh, on what we are seeing elsewhere in the world, right? Um, so um, this brings us to the second piece that I want to talk about. And then um, I'm going to skip this one. And we'll now go um, to the third piece, which is talk about some of the other risk loads in a broader fashion, right? So just to before we get there, let me kind of summarize what we have discussed so far. So what we just talked about is that Modernization and innovation requires some serious technologies. You are not going to be able to achieve modernization and, and innovation. You're going to innovate uh, without um, uh, bringing in some new technologies. It's just not possible with the, the technology we had earlier on. This is not capable of doing that, right? And SAS uh, has invested. Uh, quite a bit over many years and have gotten to a place where uh, we can say with confidence that um, our technology is really world class and can support and they're purpose built. That's another important but purpose built for risk and finance because we work with tons and tons of banks. I mean, we just don't sit in a corner and come up with the ideas, right? We talk with people like you, we solve problems for you, for the customers based on their feedback. We keep on retooling, rethinking on what we're doing, right? And that's why we invest so heavily in this via, uh, foundational platform. Second point is that for the VIA foundational platform to take advantage of it and move your risk and finance process on top of it, you don't have to do in one fell swoop, right? In other words, you don't have to go from zero to one. You, there is a lot of numbers in between, right? So the, um, and, and we did this very mindfully and very deliberately. That's why we introduced the idea of these uh, APIs, 
which allows via base foundations to talk to other technologies. That's a very critical point. So in other words, if you use it, you don't have to say, oh, I'm going to give up everything and go somewhere else. No, you can be in the middle somewhere for a time, for some time. You won't get all the advantages, right? Because if you are in the middle, but over time, you can, you can move over, right? Third thing I want to show is that the platform is just not a, um, uh, uh, is not a proof concept, it's a real system. That's why it's being used by so many customers worldwide, right? And they have, some of them have moved their critical processes on top of this foundational platform, right? And I gave you two examples of this. One is the scoring issue. And, and it's important because if you look at what's happened the last couple of years with respect to the pandemic, many of the models that were estimated earlier on, they, they have to be recalibrated because, the, the, you know, the data has changed. So when the, the, the way we used to score customers based on uh, which we thought were credit worthy, because of what has happened in the last couple of years, things have changed. So these models have to be rebuilt and all banks are struggling with it. To be able to rebuild these models and deploy them, right, uh, is not an easy task, right? And many of our customers are struggling with it. So this platform, for example, is helping them build those models, deploy them in a production-worthy way very quickly, right? So that's a very important point of, the, of this presentation, that this foundation uh, system allows you to do exactly that. The third thing we talked about is that to be able to use these models, these models have to be connected because the models themselves give you some output, but with the output, you have to be able to run a process. You have to take the information and then put it into some kind of workflow so that you can make some business calls on top of it, right? So the business decisioning, you know, we call it intelligent decisioning, it's just a SaaS term, um, is built into the system. So in other words, you can you can do the data, uh, the feature engine, the, 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 the data discovery process, the visualization, the building process, the governance process, and connecting them to the decisioning process on the same platform without going elsewhere. Right, this part of the same platform. We talked about that. We talked about the fact that the users of the system don't have to be uh, technologists. The idea is to create self-service. In other words, business users should be able to use a system to for their purposes easily without calling technology to do this and the other. Right? I mean, there's a technical ang angle to it, of course. Right? So the technology teams also have a role to play. Right? But the idea is that they are going to, the system is designed in such a way so that they can provide the services that they're good at, but that does not stop the business users to use, use the system more productively. So it creates a separation of duties and a sort of independence, right? And that's a very critical point of structure. Then we talked about how risk, which was very siloed, right, in many ways, and has gotten better in coming together. Uh, and finance can really be integrated using these technologies. And why that's important? It's because regulators are asking us to do that, right? And firms are themselves realizing they have to do it to be more competitive, right? And this technology allows you to do exactly that, right? So. Those are the things we discussed so far. And we talked, the second one we talked with respect to ALM uh, and the Kamakura piece, but you know, the next section we will talk about is some of the other risk functions we can think of which play into this conversation. Okay. So that's the summary of what we discussed so far. So let's, let's talk about the last piece and then we can uh, have a bit of a conversation. Yeah? Unless there are any, any questions that I can take. Sure. You want to use Right. So you have mentioned before um, the MRM, right? Model risk management, uh, which over the years became a pain in the neck, right? Uh, and uh, uh, these days, you know, just stupid, simple formula is called model. Right, and uh, if we're looking at the process of model development, starting from data ingestion until 
uh, the deployment, right? So it's generated a huge e uh, effort and burden on development teams. And the question if, and by the way, it's, you know, the guidance is different from domain to domain. Great scoring, KLM, right? We have different framework. So the question if SAS is providing or is planning to provide automatic framework to provide uh, standard model validation, documentation, um, to satisfy, we have no representative from regulators, right? Uh, but just to make it easier, uh, easy life for, for development teams. No, 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 that's exactly right. So, um, as I said, like in uh, in the US, um, SR 11.7 is a very, very critical um, regulated regulation. They got actually got updated last year again. And um, I've been to several customer meets like this in the last um, few weeks now. And um, this has become a, a top priority for a number of reasons, okay? I mean, this model risk management is being discussed all the time now, right? And there are two or three reasons for it. One is, uh, as I mentioned earlier on, the data structures, right, and the drivers have changed uh, quite a bit in the last couple of years, given we, what we, you know, what we all experience worldwide, okay? And uh, it is not ended right? Uh, it still has some ways to go. But there are some other uh, risk factors that has been introduced into the picture. So one of the problems that many institutions we, I talk to have come across is that they need to um, rebuild their models. Second uh, thing I didn't mention so far is that there is a realization that many of these models will not last as long as it lasted in the past. You know, earlier on you build a model, you know, you know I, I, I'll tell you in, in my past, I was in, um, I was responsible for algorithmic trading for Merrill Lynch, I had to work for. And their trading model would not last than a month, uh, maybe three weeks like sometimes, because the, uh, the tra you know, somebody would find some inaccuracy or some better advantage and build another model, right? So we had constantly build models, right? There was no MRM because, you know, it was... So it's not like that as an extreme case, but he, even in this case, the modeling has to be, has, one is the structures have changed, right? People are realizing the models will not last as long as they have, so they have to constantly build models, which means they have to build and deploy because if you, if it takes too long to build get it past your um, internal systems. So, you know, typically what happens is the line of business will build a model, right? Then somebody will check it. Then uh, then the auditors will sign off, right? Uh, in the States, will the regulators have to prove that you're right. So it, it's a long process. It can take 18 months, roughly. I mean, give me an average number, 18 months to, by the time the model's efficacy has already gone down to some extent. So you really have to be able to do this fast, right? The second thing that's happened is um, because of this open source move, right? This constant innovation, right? So people are coming with new libraries and say, I, I, there's a better way of doing this or something like that. So how, and different business clients want to use different sorts of systems. That's partly because they have a bias, partly because of skill set, partly, you know, somebody came from some other firm and said, I used, you know, R there. I'm going to use R here. Yeah, I, you know, I don't want to use uh, SAS, I don't want to use R, Python, I want to use R, right? So it's very difficult to say every de department will have to use this. I mean, you just, it doesn't work that way anymore, okay? So if you can't force, let's say a bank has got four divisions, each division is doing one thing, you can't say it will be one system because then everything is slow down, right? So you need to create an environment where you give people the freedom to build the models, but in such a way that you don't go crazy. Like, you know, you know exactly what's going on. Uh, you can deploy the models, you can govern, and you have confidence, right? And the business leaders can say, yeah, I know that model was built correctly. It's not, because there are also rules around, uh, if the models are, let's say, are not making sure there's fair lending or something like that, you know, that's a problem. 
There's another topic, by the way, and I think in some way asked this question earlier on. This is an issue, right? So, take, and then the third thing is that historically we were, for a number of reasons, uh, and a lot of this technology, uh, but other reasons too, we could not use certain types of information and data because they were not available or we could not be modeled, right? Especially behavioral models. Now you want to incorporate that sort of information in the model building process. So technology, types of data available, because different people want to use different things for different reasons, right? This whole, pro this, you know, five years back, no one talked about model ops. You know, we started talking about data ops. Now we're talking about model, because people realize that there's a field called model ops, which is a subset of data ops, uh, of de DevOps, because building these models has got its own sorts of requirements, right? And this is a space that SAS is always very good at. Historically, SAS was all about this. We didn't call it middle model ops, we called it whatever else we call it. But we are really good at this stuff. And what we have also been very good at for the last few years is understanding that models themselves don't do anything. Models will have to be connected to specialized workflows and solutions. And that's why we started building credit processes around ECL and stress testing and this and ALM now, right? So, so we got that story, right? So we already had the foundational pieces, right? We started, because that's what the customers are telling us. Everything we do is based on what customers tell us. So that's how we had putting this together. So it's become a very, this MRM piece has become extremely relevant right now. Extremely relevant. In every conference you go or talk to a bunch of customers, they'll say MRM, 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 system. Let me add a let me add a couple of sure. couple of comments uh, because uh, uh, obviously as uh, as uh, Sumit is saying MRM uh, is becoming core. You are raising also some elements related. Yes, how we can automate documentation. So what we can. now in this direction, one of the key aspects is that historically, especially in uh, in Europe, uh, we were under a lot of uh, pressure to uh, document and validate the models and to provide uh, all the elements uh, to the to the supervisor. So what we have done is that. Uh, during the development process, the system allows you to generate documentation of the sums of many of the steps. For example, one of the basic activities that you have to generate, generate the derived uh, variables that will become input to, for your uh, PD models and whatever. <coughs> this aspect that, that is usually done by the developers becomes usage, usually an issue when you have to deploy the model and then when you have to document uh, what the decisions that you have taken. So the point is that from our perspective, what you can do right now is that whatever language you are using, but you have a graphical interface that the business user can use to, again, or link uh, codes that he has, or use graphical interface to apply all these uh, transformation. The nice thing is that the application generated the, doc the document that you can provide directly or to the IT when they will deploy the model, the system will generate both the documentation and the ETL process that the IT can deploy when uh, in a, in a, to production. So again, it's not a big effort, or better, it's not a big added value. But the point is that in many cases, as as a developers, we need to spend a lot of time documenting things that at the end of the story we have already decided. So all the decisions has already make it, make it taken. So the logic for us is how to automatize how to automatize what we can, also in terms of documentation, and we have done it for both the transformation of the variables and the generation of the derived variables, all the decisions that you are taking and you are challenging during the phase of the development, all these elements are stored and available for internal audit, for internal validation department, and also for the supervisor. The other aspect is that in many cases, while you are in the process of the development, there is always the balance. I mean, you close the project, you close the development, and then you pass everything to the valid internal validation department, or, and then how they start, they sh should they start from scratch or what? So the logic is that we have a single repository in the MRM where you develop uh, using the risk modeling all what you need, interacting with open sources as uh, Sumit was saying, but then everything is stored. This is available in a repository. Even if you don't care yet about the model risk assessment, you have a single repository where you store everything and you start with a model governance. So you have the models there, internal validation need to start, uh, they don't, wait for your mail. They are alerted that something is coming, they can assess, then they can do in their environment what they need. And so there's a collaborative process 
trace it. So supervisor approve it because again, we have many customers validated in Europe and across the world for this process. And the point is that so collaboratively, you can work on the same platform or even with different technologies and you have a single layer where you have all the models. Now, I was focusing the attention mostly on the PD models because it's where we have usually more scrutiny from uh, the supervisor. But the same logic can be applied across all the models. And again, Sumit also in his previous career, step of his career, he was leading a, 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 a working in a bank, leading a project for the for the MRM. So, so he, he can explain also even in a very pragmatic way how they handle it in uh, in, uh, in the bank. But the point for us is really how to, you know, already the capabilities for SaaS. And now, as uh, Sumit was saying, the machine learning is increasing the complexity and also the risk. Because again, all the fairness topic, the ethics and the AI, this is generating a, a strong increase. And I have understood from the colleagues that in Israel, it's not yet a not topic, but in Europe it is, in the US it is. So this is something that we need to have to assess everywhere. And again, we have enriched our modern risk solution specifically with a modern card to assess a potential bias in, uh, in the model, starting from the data and including also the, all the intermediate steps during, uh, during the development of the model. So there are plenty of contents that we have uh, 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 included in the, in the solution. So again, try to, on one end, uh, allow you to be as flexible as you want in terms of algorithms or, uh, or languages, but on the other side, having a framework that allow you to automatize the processes, because otherwise, again, open source is all nice, but when you have to operationalize them, good luck. Good luck, because then there are so many item costs. I mean, we have done this many times. Business case showing at the end of the story. Yes, true, you are not paying uh, the, the, the open source, but all the item costs around make the project much more expensive than go to a framework that is organized to end of end to end the process. And we can show this type of debate because we have done it. And again, we started, we started in US, uh, this type of activities. And then again, the point is after a while, they came back looking for a platform like the via one that uh, that uh, that Sumit was showing because some at the end is more is cheaper than go to 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 pure open source. Thank you. And, 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 uh, exactly right. And I'll just give two other examples which might be of interest to you. So if you look at the insurance industry, <clears throat> they have plenty of models too. <clears throat> and <clears throat> I know you're not from insurance, but just to give you an uh, analogy. In the insurance industry, they have plenty of models. There is now some specialized regulation in the New York State, if insurance comes in New York State, because in the US, uh, the insurance companies are regulated by the state bodies. It's no federal system, that's the way we are, uh, not for bank. But uh, for insurance companies, now these insurance companies, although there's no regulation, they are proactively looking at how to bring model risk management into the systems because it is good practice. Because the leaders, leadership in the in these firms are thinking, good God, if I if I don't know what my guys are doing, and what models are being built, and what's being used for what what the decision, and I don't have control over it, I don't know. Somebody can build a model and say, oh, I you know those people I will not give a premium to, or I'm going to charge five percent or whatever it is, right? It becomes a very messy situation. So people are proactively looking at it. And this other example I can give you is, uh, and we'll talk more in detail later on. So there's a big discussion about ESG, and we'll talk about that later on, right? But you may have read in the news that many institutions have gotten into very difficult situations right now because like open source is a, you know, obviously a very popular topic, ESG is a very popular topic. So lots of asset managers and wealth managers of banks have said, oh, my fund is ESG, has meets ESG criteria. So one of the conversations in the model space is, okay, you're saying you are ESG compliant and you are, you know, but can you prove this to me that, that this is really so? That you're saying I should invest? This is a model risk governance issue, right? 